Good morning, Conyers First United Methodist Church family. It's good to see you this morning. I hope you're ready to worship together today and lift up the Lord's name together. And as we do, we remember and celebrate each week that God is good all the time. And all the time, God is good. And it's good to be with you this week. And as we prepare for worship today, we encourage you to be sure and check out the things that are going on in your bulletin. We've got a lot of fun stuff going on. We just had a new Sunday school class start this morning. If you don't have a Sunday school home, we hope you'll check the new class out. You can see Chris Harwood, Elizabeth Giannisi, Charlotte Kinsey, about more info on that. But that's a great thing that we've got going on. Um, as we look to fall, we want to launch our fall discipleship groups. And as we do that, if you feel the Spirit calling you to facilitate or lead a group, we want to find any way we can to help you do that. So let Shane or let me know, and we, we will work with you on that as well. We'd love to launch. We, every semester, we would love to launch more groups than we had the semester before. And that takes the Lord calling folks like you to come find a way to join us in that. And so we hope you'll do that. Um, we have lots of good mission opportunities. This is the last week for our baby bottle drive, so if you're still filling up your baby bottle next Sunday, bring it with you, and during the closing hymn, you can bring it down the altar and lay it on the altar, uh, and we'll do that together. Those that, that I know many have turned it in already, but if you haven't, do that. And then secondly, we want to help our local elementary schools with school supplies, and Shane is working on this with us, and so uh, making sure you help with that. And then the third thing is, is our food pantry is used a lot, and it is getting slim. So if you can bring some fresh items to our food pantry and help us restock, that is a great mission for our community uh, when they feel hungry and, and need some extra food. Then in addition, we're, we're uh, doing a farewell reception for Melissa Carter and her family in two weeks. And we encourage you to, uh, to join us in that. Melissa has been a huge blessing to this church and community and to our preschool, and we want to send them out uh, on a high of thanks. And then on top of all that, this week we begin Salem Camp Meeting, and we're looking forward to a fun week ahead there with our choir singing on Friday, with the men's ensemble on Sunday, with our picnic Sunday afternoon, so there is just a lot of great ways to get involved and get plugged in. We hope that you will find something and make a difference and get involved. So I think those are the main things we have to share this morning. Cecil Goodrow wants to come up and share a quick word with us, and then we will uh, begin worship together. Good morning. Thank you, Pastor Chris. So we have so much to celebrate, don't we? And before we begin this worship with our call to worship, I just wanted to make this quiet comment. Um, an anniversary passed this week uh, without um, any reflection on it as a body here and on behalf of our leadership board. I just want to lift up to you that um, we have welcomed with the beginning of a new pastoral year, Pastor Chris back with us. You all know that as Methodists, uh, about this time of the year, many Methodist churches get new, new pastors. And I, I felt like we just needed to say directly in our worship services how much we love you, Pastor Chris, and, and also your family, particularly the four of you that we see each Sunday, because uh, you all have just dived into ministry and servanthood so well among us. Some of our uh, sister churches that are close by are welcoming brand new pastors, and we're uh, blessed uh, enough to be able to welcome back Pastor Chris. I hope this will be the, the second of many, many more years. We love you. Please speak to Chris and Andrea and Mallory and Chandler as you get a chance before you leave today. Thank you. beginning God created the heavens and the earth 
He made the moon, the stars, the living creatures. He made male and female, and God blessed them. And man turned to God and said, O Lord, our God, how majestic is your name above everything living. And God said, I will never leave you or forsake you.
Glory, hallelujah. Great job. Will you stand and let's pray together as we celebrate Jesus' salvation and goodness to all of us. Oh, Father, we praise you today. We thank you for this chance to gather and worship and to recognize and celebrate our great salvation in Jesus Christ. Lord Jesus, your grace has overwhelmed us and welcomed us and transformed us. And Lord, we live in a world where that saving work is still going on outside these walls and inside the walls. And so we say, thank you, Lord Jesus. We invite the power of the Holy Spirit to bring your salvation to our hearts and lives in this place in a way that we can be the church, the body of Christ, the hands and feet of Jesus in our community and for the sake of our world. So, Lord, we set our heart upon you today in Jesus' name. Amen. And amen. Will you join with me and let's sing Praise My Soul, the King of Heaven. Let's sing together number 66 in the hymnal. time today. There's uh, lots of folks to keep in prayer. One praise I do want to share. I was talking with uh, Tom Christian earlier today, and you know, he's been battling cancer. He came back and said he is cancer free, so we praise God for that. <laughs> and we thank God for his miracles and healing, and we continue to lift up Kay Rivenbark and Martha Barrett in their cancer battles as well. In addition, keep others on our prayer list in your prayers. Folks like Nancy Blackwell, uh, who fell and hit her head and broke her arm. So keep her in prayer this week. Um, and then as well, uh, Larry Kinsey, I hear you're going in for a procedure. We're praying for you too, okay? So any other prayer requests to share in today locally? And then across the world, there's a whole lot to lift up in prayer too. Uh, there was a shooting in South Africa. Sri Lanka's government is in chaos. The prime minister in Japan. The war in Ukraine. Uh, change in prime minister in the UK. So, so our world is, is going through a, a bit of a shaky season in many places. So if you'll join me, let's intercede and let uh, God go to work and continue his work. Father in heaven, we love and praise you today. We thank you for your goodness, mercy, and grace. And oh God, it's good that we can come to you 
and find a home in your love and in your grace. Lord, we thank you for your forgiveness, Lord Jesus, that you bought and purchased for us by your death. Lord, we are not worthy of it, but you save us anyway. You forgive us and you lift us up and you make us into something new. And so, Lord, we want to allow your holiness just to continue to take root in our hearts and lives in ways that brings about our best in your glory. And Father God, we intercede for the sick among us. We thank you for doing miracles like in the life of Tom Christian and, and that, that just destroying his cancer. And we pray that that would continue to be the case in his body and in his life. But we intercede for brothers and sisters who need your healing care like Martha Barrett and Kay Rivenbark and Nancy Blackwell. Come Holy Spirit and be at work in and among them. Heal them, comfort them, and strengthen them. In Jesus' name, Lord, we, uh, we come against the sickness and we proclaim your life-healing power for them today. And Father God, help send us out. We are called to be your people, to come together and to love one another, to go out and to be lights and witnesses and disciple-makers in our community and in this world. And Lord, help us just to heed your call to respond to it using the gifts you've given us, to be courageous and to share our faith. Lord, we pray that your kingdom will continue to grow in our church and around us all, uh, to the ends of the earth. Oh God, in this we pray for our nation. We pray that you'd bring us together. We pray for a spirit of renewal and revival, that you'd awaken hearts to faith in Jesus and new creation and new life in Christ. Lord, we pray, O oh God, that uh, you'll guide our leaders and bless just people all over this land and draw us as a country back having soft hearts open to trusting and following you. And, O oh God, I pray as well just for our world today. So many things going on in so many places. We pray the love and kingdom of Jesus would continue to be at work in all these places and ways. Lord, that the heart of Jesus might be at work among the people of Japan, in South Africa, in the Middle East, in the Ukraine, in England, and other places that need a fresh wind of your spirit to be at work uh, making disciples and growing your church. Lord, we want to see your heavenly kingdom be an earthly, earthly reality. And so, Lord, we pray that your work might be done in and through us as we pray the prayer of Jesus, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. But lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Once again, we have a different, an opportunity to make a difference in our giving. And thank you, all your giving does, to help us continue the ministry and mission here at Conyers First, and in so many ways around our community and world. And so as our ushers come forward, Let's give with a generous and loving, joyful heart.
we praise you today. We give thanks and we echo the prayer of St. Francis of Assisi and just offer you all our hearts and all our lives and all our voices that we may be your instruments in this broken world. So Lord, uh, send us out and multiply these gifts for your glory. We want to make this world more like you. Make it a better place in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, if you'll stay standing, I want to invite you to join with me with a statement of faith from the Korean Methodist Church. I promise the Apostles' Creed will be back next Sunday. I know I know some of you that's your favorite and it's easy greasy, but I especially want you to look at the words about the nature of the church from our brothers and sisters in the Korean Methodist Church. So number 884, let's share together this wonderful statement of the Christian faith. We believe in the one God, creator and sustainer of all things, father of all nations, the source of all goodness and beauty, all truth and love. We believe in Jesus Christ, God manifest in the flesh, our teacher, example, and redeemer, the savior of the world. We believe in the Holy Spirit, God present with us for guidance, for comfort, and for strength. We believe in the forgiveness of sins, in the life of love and prayer, and in grace equal to every need. We believe in the Word of God contained in the Old and New Testaments as the sufficient rule of both faith and practice. We believe in the Church, those who are united in the living Lord for the purpose of worship and service. We believe in the reign of God as the divine will realized in human society and in the family of God where we are all brothers and sisters. We believe in the final triumph of righteousness and in the life everlasting. Amen. Oh. seated. Good job. It's good to be back again, and we're continuing our journey through Paul's letter to the Ephesians this week, and as we do so, uh, Paul is changing his focus a bit. Uh, in chapter one, in the first chapter, it was a lot on us at a more individual level, realizing who we are and whose we are, that we are created to be children of the King that uh, we are called and adopted into God's family, that we are seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, and that this comes as we, uh, as we turn on our sin and repentance, as we come to God in his grace through the death and resurrection of Jesus, we find in that grace salvation, and in that salvation we, we make it real as we trust in Jesus through faith. And so that's kind of what we've talked about so far. But, but now, instead of Paul talking to us a little more on the individual side of who we are as the people of God, now he turns his attention more to us as the church of Jesus as a whole. And God's call to us as a movement, a gospel-centered movement in the world, and what that looks like. And so we're going to pick up again in the 10th verse, which we did read last week, and read through the rest of the second chapter. And this is what Paul shares with us today. For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Therefore, remember that 
formerly to you who are Gentiles by birth and called the uncircumcised by those who call themselves the circumcision, which, by the way, is done in the body by human hands, remember that at that, at that time you were separate from Christ. You were excluded from citizenship in Israel, foreigners to the covenants of the promise without hope and without God in the world. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who were once far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made the two groups into one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility, by setting aside in his flesh the law with its commandments and regulations. His purpose was to create in himself one new humanity out of the two, thus making peace, and in one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross by which he put to death their hostility. And so he came and he preached peace to you who were far away and peace to those who were near. For through him we both have access to the Father by one Spirit. Consequently, you're no longer foreigners and strangers, but you're fellow citizens with God's people and also members of his household, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. In him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him, you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his Spirit. This is the word of God for you and me, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Will you pray with me and for me? Lord Jesus, help me lift you up today. Lord Jesus, help me lift up what amazing work you have sought to do. Paul saw it and tried to help the early church live it out. And Lord, here it is 2,000 years later, and we still struggle to see it and believe it and live it out. So, Lord, show us the way and help us walk in it to your glory, the glory of the risen Jesus. I pray in Christ's name. Amen. Now, Paul begins this transition with verse 10. In verse 10, he talks about how how we are God's creation, God's workmanship, that we have been created in Jesus Christ to do good work, a work which God prepared in advance. This is our mission, our job. And so what job is that? What mission is that to look like? Well, in verse 11, he starts to give us his church, his mission. And as we dig into this, realize where this comes from. This comes from Paul's encounter with Jesus on the road to Damascus. This comes from Paul's encounter with Jesus that just turned his world upside down. And as a result of that, and a result of knowing clearly Jesus' call, that he wasn't just to go and save Jewish folks, he was to go and save the world. It blew his mind. And so the basis for everything he says here is the lordship of Jesus Christ. And so to turn back and remind you of that, in chapter 1, he mentions this, that Jesus rose from the dead, was seated at the right hand in the heavenly realms, far above all rule, authority, power, and dominion, every name that is named, not only in the present age, but also in the age to come. God has placed all things under the feet of Jesus. He has appointed Jesus to be head over everything for the church, which is Jesus' body, the fullness of Christ that fills everything, that fills everything in every way. Uh, Theologians call this the cosmic Christ. This idea that Jesus is not just Lord of the Jewish folk. Jesus is Lord of all. 
And Jesus longs for him and his church to gather all the peoples into his kingdom saving love in Jesus Christ. And as Paul sees this work out in a reality in the church of Ephesus, a church that had Jewish folks and Gentile folks, he leads into the statements that we're about to read that still rock us 2,000 years later, as they did Paul 2,000 years ago. And I'm going to phrase what I, sh- I'm going to share kind of what Paul says, but I want to do it more from an American perspective, and so I'm going to use sort of the help of the insight of a fellow named Mark Damas. Mark Damas is lead pastor at a multicultural church in Missouri, and Mark Damas, you know, has has preached on these ver- verses, and I think has done a very good job. And so I'm going to kind of put on my Mark hat and pretend to be him just for a bit, uh, because he just shares the insight so well. So, so this may be how it would be if Paul was speaking not to the Ephesus, but to us in America. He says, Paul says this, Remember, you were once Gentiles by birth, called the uncircumcised by those called the circumcision. And so what Paul is saying here, brothers and sisters, is he's saying something like this. If you're African American here with us today, I just want to talk to you guys for a bit. Can I just talk to you? Do you remember the time when white folk used to use the N-word when they talked about you? Do you remember how you felt with that? Do you remember the time when as a nation you didn't have the right to vote? You could only go into some buildings, some water fountains, some bathrooms. For a while, for too long, you were slaves, not even considered citizens of this great land. Do you remember that and how it made you feel? You were on the outside looking in. You didn't know if you could have a home. And then Paul says, I'm here to tell you today, God has torn down the walls and you have a home in Jesus. That's what he's saying. You see, the Jewish people were the privileged folk back then. They were the special circumcised folks. They knew that they were God's people. They were under the covenant of God's promises. They were part of the nation of Israel, God's special people. They knew God loved them. They knew they were privileged. But these other folks, they were unclean. They were born unclean. They were unclean because they weren't circumcised. They were unclean because they liked pork barbecue. They were unclean because they liked shrimp. And so for them, the church and kingdom were far away. And so Paul speaks to the Gentiles. He speaks to those who in our community who are on the outside looking in, asking the question, can God really love me too? Do I have a place in his kingdom? Do I have a place in his church? Paul tells us here the answer is an undoubted and resounding yes. Jesus died, Paul writes, and shed his blood to draw us back home to himself. And brothers and sisters, this ramification goes for black and white, it goes for Asian, it goes for Hispanic, it goes for all sorts of cultures and all sorts of people, all sorts of places, but the ramifications for this also go deeper. Jesus is Lord of all people, right? And all means all. To anybody on the outside looking in, Wondering, is there a place here for me? So people wrestling with their sexual identity, people wrestling with gender identity, Jesus invites all of us to repent of our sin, to come to Jesus in his grace for salvation, and to find a new life in Christ. It doesn't matter who we are. God's desire in heaven is for heaven to be filled with all who will come. 
And all means all. And the church is to be a place that offers the saving grace of Jesus to all. And as a result, in verse 14, he says, Jesus is our peace because he has made the two into one. He's destroyed the barrier between us and torn down the dividing wall of hostility. You know, one of the uh, one main areas where we struggle as sinners is we love to be tribal. We love to have our favorite group of our favorite people and say, this is us. We are the privileged group, like the Jews. And those on the outside, well, they're supposed to be on the outside because they're not as good as us. We just love to do that. Of course, we don't realize, like on our painting outside, right? Uh, you know, the, we have the new painting out there, the Last Supper. And, I, you know, I'm sure you probably noticed, none of them look European white, right? Jesus was a brown person. The disciples were brown Middle Eastern Jews. That's who they were. We were the Gentiles on the outside looking in, saying, does God include us too? And now we've kind of moved and flipped the table, you know, and all that kind of stuff. And what Paul says here is Jesus died to be our peace, not just peace with God. He's not just talking peace with God. He's talking peace between the different people groups on the planet. He has already torn down the wall. The problem is, is we find reasons to love our cliques and to love our groups and just rebuild them again. But Jesus, Paul writes, tore them down on the cross 2,000 years ago. And we are to look like the kingdom right here, right now. And how will the world know that we are Jesus' disciples? When we love one another across racial lines, across language lines, across ethnic lines, across whatever lines we like to draw. Jesus has torn down the walls. He has made us new. He has set aside in his flesh the law with its commands and regulations. Now, what is Paul talking about here? I don't think he's talking about the moral law. That is the call of God to, to move toward righteousness and to move toward holiness. Right? He's not laying aside the moral law. What is he talking about? He's talking about the component in the Jewish law that was cultural and ritualistic. The culture and ritual law let Jewish people knew, know excuse me, that they were Jewish and that others weren't. And there was a purpose for that in the Old Testament. But the purpose for that had come to an end. And so now the ritual part of the law, the cultural part of the law, the circumcision, right, the what you eat, the eating shrimp and barbecue and all that, all that uh, kind of stuff that made you say, well, I am clean and everybody else is unclean. I am good and everybody else is in a lot of trouble. The Lord, he just, his death annihilated all that and said it's not about the walls we build, even in the Old Testament law that cause us to think of ourselves as better than other people or cause us to think of ourselves as more important than other people, or that God loves us more than other people. Jesus came and tore down the wall and is building a new body together that represents what God is up to. Brothers and sisters, every Sunday, right, in our, the end of our prayer time, we pray the Lord's Prayer. And at the heart of of that prayer is a revolutionary prayer. Every time you pray it, you're praying this. Did you know that? Lord, let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Heaven is going to be filled with people from every tribe, every nation, every tongue, every language, rich, poor, you know, you name it, there are going to be folk there in heaven that follow Jesus, that love the Lord their God, that are transformed by His grace, they're going to be there. 
And so all Paul is saying is, that's what heaven looks like. Church, our privilege is to live that out in this world, in our communities, in our church, right here, right now. Because when we do that, people look at us and say, ah, God really is alive because they love each other. And they welcome anyone to their community who wants to follow Jesus. That's our witness, brothers and sisters. Our church is struggling some in America today, and in large part it's struggling because we have chosen segregation instead of the kingdom values that Paul talks about in the letter to Ephesus. And the world notices. I mean, maybe 50 years ago we didn't notice a whole lot. But this younger culture looks at us and says, you don't look like my community. You don't look like my school. Why should I believe what you have to tell me? Right? And so the churches that will represent the kingdom in the coming ages are going to be those churches that really believe and live out. Jesus has torn down the wall and brought us all together as one. And that's an amazing kind of thing to live out. And so he goes on and tells us about what this new reality looks like. He says, For through Jesus we both have access to the Father by one Spirit. For through Jesus we both have access to the Father by one Spirit. And this is a, kind of the heart of our call that, that it doesn't matter who you are. God is hears our prayers because we pray to the Father and we pray to the Father through the Lord Jesus it's Jesus who is the one who brings us to the Father through his death and resurrection and we pray by the Holy Spirit or in the Holy Spirit and that uh, I want you to kind of get this this was revolutionary to me when I thought about it um, what would amaze the early church in the ancient world is when the Holy Spirit showed up in someone's heart and life that they totally did not expect to happen, right? These unclean Gentiles, they're never going to make it to heaven. Then God pours out his Holy Spirit on them. And the church has to say, well, if God's going to say yes to them, I guess we've got to say yes too, right? And that's what the early church did, is the Holy Spirit was an indication that someone was saved, that someone was growing in holiness, that someone was in the family as brothers and sisters. And so today, one of the things I try to recognize is, if I see the Holy Spirit at work in somebody's life, no matter how much I want to put that person on the outside, I can't. They're my brother and sister in Jesus Christ. Because we pray to the Father through Jesus together by the one Spirit. And so consequently, the end result is, he says, is listen, you're no longer foreigners or strangers. You no longer have to be left out in the cold without hope and without God. No, you're fellow citizens with God's people. You're members of his household. You're built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself anchoring everything together as the chief cornerstone. And in Jesus, this whole building is joined together and it rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in Jesus, you too, no matter how much you feel left out, you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. There it is again. When we encounter the Holy Spirit, we're encountering family. We're all a part of what God is doing together. And Paul truly believes that the Lord really didn't intend for us to have Jewish churches and Gentile churches or black churches and white churches or Hispanic churches or Asian churches or, or Russian churches. Instead, we are called to be the church because the wall is torn down. And we all are family. And we are to try to reflect that in, in how we worship and how we love one another and, and all those things. Isn't that amazing? It's beautiful. And that's who we're supposed to be. You know, uh, 
some multi-ethnic churches on Sunday, they'll get up and they'll sing a couple of verses in Spanish just to reflect the importance of the Spanish culture in our country. Not all the verses, but some. You know, if, if in Conyers we had an, another group of folks who maybe speak, spoke Laotian or maybe spoke Malay or spoke Cantonese, I mean, yes, the more the merrier. Worshiping together for God's glory, representing the kingdom that we're moving toward. Those are the churches that will make a difference in the days to come. And so my heart and prayer is, Lord, I don't know how to do this, but help us be that kind of church for all people. I don't know how to do it, but, but it, you know, the one thing I can do is I can try to hire a staff that, that looks like our community, and so we've been trying to do that. And we've got great staff members who are doing a great job in all sorts of areas. But, but Lord, I don't know how to do it, but I know that that's what your kingdom looks like. That's what you want us to look like. And so help us. Help us by your miraculous presence do that in our lives. You know, I'd love to look more like Mosaic Church, which again is Mark Demaz's church in, in Missouri. In his church, they have 600 worship every Sunday, right? And in that worship of 600 folks, he's got people from 24, 25, 26 different nations that gather together every week. It's not the biggest church in their community in Missouri, but it's vital. They're impacting their community. They're impacting all around the world. They have a heart that, you know, and it may not be easy, but it reflects the glory of God. It's amazing. So my heart and prayer is that somehow the Lord might help take us in similar steps to represent what Paul is talking about. So how do we do that? Do the two, two things I hope you'll take home. One is, where have you had a tendency maybe to build walls? Where have you had a tendency to build walls and say, uh-uh, I ain't going there, not with those kind of folks. Brothers, when we build walls, we are working against the creator of the universe. When we build walls, we're working against... I, I don't, want, I don't want to be one that get to heaven and say, Chris, you were building walls. And I know, I've done it some too. I don't want to be building walls. So can you ask the Lord, help us tear down the walls that keep us from loving our community and loving one another for God's glory. And then secondly, for any who feel like they're on the outside looking in and wondering, does church have a place for me? Does God have a place for me and his family? Has he already given up and sent me to hell? I hope that you'll hear in this call, no, Jesus loves you. He died just as much for you as for anybody. And he will guide you if you'll make him your Lord and follow him and trust him and respond to that grace. I don't know where he'll lead you to go, but he will. And we want to be a place that welcomes you here because you, through the Holy Spirit, are a part of the family. That's who we're to be, brothers and sisters. And it's revolutionary. It was revolutionary 2,000 years ago. It's revolutionary today. But I pray that the Lord can help us look more like that. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, um, this is amazing stuff. It's stuff to really wrestle with. I know it's not easy for many of us to swallow. I know it's not. But Paul had an insight into your heart of saving grace, into your heart and what your death, Lord Jesus, meant and how it saves and redeems and how it calls us to holiness and to love and how it calls us to be a new body that looks different from anything we've known before. And so, Holy Spirit, help us allow you to tear down the walls in our heart and life. Lord, let your Holy Spirit also help us, if we're on the outside looking in, to know that, yes, God's love 
is for all. His salvation is for all. He died for the sin of all. And we are all called to come together and be the church of Jesus for his glory. And Lord, we need your help. Because often the church today looks too much like us. and Not enough like you. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We close with, there's a spirit in the air. The altar is always open. But let's lift our heart and voices and respond to this God who loves us amazingly. Amen? Let's stand. 192. stay with us. We've got some new folks coming to join us today, and so I want your help to welcome them. Uh, this is Ann and Jerry Sizemore, and they've been around uh, for several months now, but we're glad to have you guys officially in the family. And so uh, we need your help in welcoming them to the family, so if you'll turn to page, oh, I always have to remember where it is, I think uh, 55 maybe? We'll find it. How about let's do 48. We can do 48. It's like in there several times, so we'll just find one of them. 48. Brothers and sisters, I commend to your love and care this Sizemore family, whom we this day receive into the membership of this congregation. Do everything in your power to increase their faith, confirm their hope, and perfect them in love. We rejoice to recognize you as members of Christ's holy church and bid you welcome to this congregation of the United Methodist Church. With you, we renew our vows to uphold it by our prayers, our presence, our gifts, our service, and our witness. With God's help, we so order our lives after the example of Christ that surrounded by steadfast love, you may be established in the faith and confirmed and strengthened in the way that leads to life eternal. Now, Ann and Jerry, just to quickly reaffirm your faith, we all profess faith uh, in the Lord Jesus as Savior and Lord. And then uh, will you support this church as your church family home with your prayers, your presence, your gifts, your service, and your witness? Awesome. Well, we welcome you along. We're glad to have you all here. Uh, be sure, y'all come with me outside and we'll let people greet you, okay? All right, thanks for being with us today. I know today's 
kind of a challenging message, but I hope you'll wrestle with it. Go in the love of a father who doesn't want to let any of us go. He loves his children all over this world, so much so that he sent his son, the Lord Jesus, to die on the cross and to tear down the wall, the wall that kept heaven shut. Go now in the power of the Holy Spirit, living that power of love for one another, recognizing the presence of the Spirit in those you least expect, and welcoming them to the family, now and always, for God's glory in Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. We'll see you next week. Amen.